Contentment, or if you please, Confession, was a poem composed by Thomas Paine in 1796. He was living in Paris at the time, recovering from a harrowing 10-month experience in a Luxembourg prison. Though his imprisonment physically took its toll and nearly his life, it did prove fruitful with respect to his creative output. Contentment, or if you please, Confession, was inscribed to Ruth Barlow, and its heading reads, to Mrs. Barlow, on her pleasantly telling the author that after writing against the superstition of the scripture religion, he was setting up a religion capable of more loyalty and enthusiasm, and more dangerous to its votaries, that of making a religion of love. Ruth was the wife of Joel Barlow. Joel was a close friend to Payne, a noted poet, a diplomat, and politician. Contentment, or if you please, confession, to my ear has a tone and style that reads and sounds almost contemporary. With that impression, my initial musical setting was full out pop rock in style. However, I eventually settled on a more traditional acoustic blues setting, with Payne's six stanzas matching the classic 12 bar blues form quite easily. I decided to record it with an alternative title in step with its decidedly blues setting. And so I give you Tom Payne's Do Good Blues. said to be of considerable beauty and was used primarily for balls and late night suppers. Watson's Annals of Philadelphia states that Bachelor's Hall had a fine open view to the scenery of the Delaware. Christopher Marshall noted in his diary on April 4th, 1775, this morning a fire begun at nine o'clock at Bachelor's Hall, which soon consumed the building. 
Other sources state that all the wooden portions were destroyed, which would seem to indicate that it was a brick building as previously described, but perhaps had a wooden roof and interior. The burning of Bachelor's Hall inspired several poems, one by Francis Hopkinson, another by George Webb, and this one by our free thought hero, Thomas Paine. His poems entitled Impromptu on Bachelor's Hall at Philadelphia being destroyed by lightning, 1775. If you do the math, you'll note that Thomas was not able to enjoy Bachelor's Hall for very long, just a few months, for he arrived in Philadelphia November 1774. I hope you enjoy my musical setting of Bachelor's Hall. and Bacchus as frequently absent likewise that the Synod began to inquire out the reason suspecting the culprits were plotting the treason at length it was found they had opened a ball at a place by the mortals called Bachelor's Hall where Venus declared every fun she could think of made nectar for the mortals to drink of And Bacchus made nectar for the mortals to drink of Displeased that such riotous doings sent time to reduce the whole building to ruins. But time was so slack with its traces and dashes that Job, in a passion, consumed it to ashes. The poem Liberty Tree was published in the Pennsylvania Magazine, July 1775. Thomas Paine was the editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine at that time, and this poem was in his very last edition. The Liberty Tree became a symbol of the American Revolution, and there were several Liberty Trees so named throughout the colonies. Large cities within the colonies adopted a Liberty Tree to show defiance against the crown. Liberty trees were purposely cut down by loyalists as the British ridiculed this revolutionary symbol. The fourth stanza is Thomas Paine attributed and depicts the conspiracy to cut down trees to often use as firewood. Just a few notes to help in understanding the colonial words. Groat is an English coin, swain is a country youth, amain means at full speed. In a chariot of light from the regions of day, the goddess of liberty came. Ten thousand celestials directed the way, and hither conducted the day. A fair budding branch from the gardens above, where millions with millions agree. She brought in her hand as a pledge of her love, the plant she named Liberty Tree. Celestial exotic struck deep in the ground, like a native it flourished and bore. The 
fame of its fruit drew the nations around to seek out this peaceable shore. Unmindful of names or distinction, they came for freemen like brothers agreed. With one spirit and due, they one friendship pursued, and the temple was liberty tree. Beneath this fair tree, like the patriarchs of old, their bread and contentment they ate. Unvexed with the troubles of silver and gold, the cares of the grand and the great. With timber and tar, the old England supplied and supported her power on the sea. The battles they fought without getting a groat for the honor of Liberty Tree. Ah, but hero ye swains, tis a tale most profane, how all the tyrannical powers, kings, commons, and lords are uniting amain to cut down this guardian of ours. From the east to the west, blow the trumpet to all through the land, let the sound of it flee. Let the far and the near all unite with the cheer in defense of our liberty tree. everyone to the 2021 Thomas Paine Day celebration. My name is Melissa Myers. I'm the national field organizer for the Center for Inquiry. It is my pleasure to be the Zoom coordinator and a co-host for today's event. I hope that all of you who logged on early and enjoyed the Thomas Paine theme concert presented by the talented performer James Clue. For four decades, James has offered private guitar and music lessons to adults and children. James also teaches songwriting and music theory. James has released four recordings of mostly his original music. His collection of unfinished musical projects includes a group of songs inspired by or otherwise connected to Thomas Paine. Thank you, James Clue. If you missed the pre-event concert, you will be able to see it when the, we post this recording of this session on YouTube. Um, before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items to con convey. This, this session is being recorded for replay on social media. By joining the session, you consent to be recorded and agree to abide by the anti-harassment, a code of conduct policy available for viewing on the co-sponsors' websites. For the best viewing, we recommend that you put your Zoom settings on speaker view. That way, you'll see the speakers in the best and biggest Zoom box possible. Everyone except the hosts and the speakers and myself will be muted. 
If you wish to speak during the social hour, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom window. I will activate your camera and microphone so you can do so. If you prefer not to be spotlighted or speak out loud or on camera, another option is for you to send me your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel. I'll happily represent resent you by re repeating your question or commentary. Again, my name is Melissa Myers. So let's start with a message from Congressman Jamie Raskin. Hey everybody, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin coming to you from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District to wish you a happy 2021 Thomas Paine Day celebration and to say hello to all of my uh, fellow Paniacs out there. Um, there's so much to celebrate with Tom Paine whose, uh, whose memory and whose message become only more urgently relevant uh, as every day goes by. Uh, Tom Paine, put uh, democracy itself and government by the people and the sovereignty of the people um, at the very center of our political philosophy. And um, as democratic movements and democratic countries around the world resist uh, all these efforts at authoritarianism and violent insurrection and fascism and racism and anti-Semitism, uh, we know that we will stand with Tom Paine and democracy and reason and the separation of church and state and the sovereignty of reason in public life. And uh, Payne, who of course was an early abolitionist also has a lot to teach us about civil rights and about social justice and reconciliation in the country. He was uh, one of the first champions of um, reparations to former slaves. Um, so, his legacy is endlessly rich and fertile for us who continue to fight for strong democracy against uh, all of the fascist undertoes of our days. So uh, happy Tom Paine Day to everybody. I hope that the uh, statue that Zenos is working on is coming along well, and we will um, continue to uh, build the legacy of uh, Tom Paine, and most importantly, the living legacy of um, strong liberal democracy for everybody. And I yield back to you. Thank you, Congressman Raskin. Now let's meet the Thomas Paine Day Celebration co-sponsors as they introduce themselves. First, we have Mandisa Tom Thomas. Everyone, I'm Mandisa Thomas founder and president of Black Nonbelievers and vice president of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a non-theistic worldview with ethical values informed by a scientific knowledge and driven by a desire to meet the needs of the people in the here and now. At the foundation of those values is an affirmation of the dignity of every human being. For over 80 years, the American Humanist Association has stood as the voice of humanism in the United States. We strive to bring about a progressive society where being good without a God is an accepted and respected way to live life. We are accomplishing this through our defense of civil liberties and secular governance, by our outreach to the growing number of people without traditional religious faith, and through a continued refinement and advancement of the humanist worldview. Pursuing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion is a moral imperative for the American Humanist Association and integral to our work. Humanist values require the affirmation of the inherent dignity of every human being, as well as the related need to create a society where all can flourish and become one's best self. And it is with this in mind that we honor Thomas Paine and his commitment to the principles of humanism, including his anti-slavery advocacy. A little known fact is that on April 14, 1775, Paine and other Philadelphia liberals formed the Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage, America's first abolitionist group. My favorite Thomas Paine quote is, I believe in the equality of man, and I believe that religious duties consist in doing justice, loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. 
The American Humanist Association acknowledges that many of our organizational founders and leaders, past and present, perpetuate and benefit from current systems of oppression. While we may be seen as progressive in some areas, we take responsibility for often being on the wrong side of justice. That history cannot be unlived, but facing these difficult truths allows us to do our best work going forward. We firmly feel that if Thomas Paine were alive today, that he would make the same acknowledgements, amend the quoted words to fit our current times, and be standing on the front lines of racial, gender, and other forms of injustice, and that he would encourage other humanists to do the same, doing more than making statements like Black Lives Matter, but to live our values through substantive action. As we commemorate the life of Thomas Paine today, let us honor his legacy in its totality by honoring his accomplishments and learning from his mistakes so that we can remain on the right side of history and justice. Please visit our website at AmericanHumanist.org to learn more about our work. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Finally, we hope that you will support not only our work and attend our upcoming annual conference in July, but also join us in supporting organizations and events that advance racial and other areas of social justice, like the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference in September. Thank you all for attending the 2021 Thomas Paine Celebration. And thank you to the Free Thought Society and our fellow co-sponsors for this event. And now I yield back to Melissa. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Blumner, CEO of the Center for Inquiry. CFI was founded in the 1970s by people like Carl Sagan, Isaac Asimov, James Randi, and Paul Kurtz because in the age of Aquarius and with the rise of the religious right, someone had to stand up for reason, science, and secularism. And I have no doubt that if Thomas Paine were alive today, he would have been part of the pantheon of CFI's founders. In his great book, The Age of Reason, Thomas Paine wrote, I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church that I know of. My own mind is my own church. Of course, Paine is writing about freedom of conscience, the right to blaspheme, and the benefits of thinking for oneself by relying on one's reasoned faculties rather than revelation. And we at the Center for Inquiry stand for all that as well. And we know that even today, more than 200 years later, Free thinkers around the world confront persecution and violence. So we sponsor a program called Secular Rescue, which is a kind of underground railroad for atheists overseas who are bravely putting themselves at risk in places like Bangladesh and Pakistan. We provide financial and other resources for atheist activists to escape to safety. At home in the United States, CFI actively defends the separation of church and state. We defend the rights of atheists and the non-religious, and we promote science and skepticism by exposing the lies of anti-vaxxers, medical quacks, and the false promises of so-called psychics. Thomas Paine and the enlightenment values of reason and science that he perpetuated are the foundation upon which CFI was built. We are delighted to participate in this day to honor this great free thinker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is delighted to co-sponsor this Thomas Paine Day event. I'm pleased also to be on the board of the newly created Thomas Paine Memorial Association. The association's goal is to educate the public about Thomas Paine and to finally erect a memorial in our nation's capital to the man who named our very nation. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has more than 35,000 non-religious members around the country and works as a vigorous state church watchdog. 
Ask for more information, including a sample of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at our website, ffrf.org. The separation of religion and government was one of Thomas Paine's ardent causes. Paine noted, Persecution is not an original feature of any religion, but it is always the strongly marked feature of all law religions or religions established by law. Paine also famously said, The world is my country, and to do good is my religion. Words to live by. Enjoy this event and remember Paine's words. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Thomas Paine Day celebration. My name is Margaret Downey. I am the president of the newly formed Thomas Paine Memorial Association and the president of the Free Thought Society. The Free Thought Society is a nonprofit 501c3 educational organization devoted to dispelling myths and superstitions, maintaining separation of religion and government, and elevating the profile of non-theism in the United States. We create and host secular events throughout the year, very similar to this Thomas Paine Day celebration. Please visit the Free Thought Society website and meetup page for details about the educational and fun upcoming events. The website address is ftsociety.org. Behind me are Thomas Paine Day proclamations that we have sponsored since 1995. My favorite Thomas Paine quotation is, the mind once enlightened cannot again become dark. These words motivate me to continue my efforts to promote non-theism by outreaching to the public through activist efforts. We hope you enjoy the presentation tonight and support each of the co-sponsors involved in the 2021 Thomas Paine Day celebration. Cheers to Thomas Paine and to all of you attending. Evening. And hello, everyone. Thanks to Margaret from the Free Thought Society and Melissa from the Center for Inquiry for all your work to set up this meaningful event. I am the president of the oldest association in America for a founder, established in 1884, the Thomas Paine National Historical Association. We were founded by progressive political activists and free thinkers to unify those progressive forces into one body led by the Truth Seeker magazine who saw pain as the embodiment of democratic philosophy and human rights. They set about to correct the false propaganda of historians and politicians about pain, which we still have to fight on that front. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, Paine's writings and legacy were actually banned in the United States. Today, he is recognized as a preeminent founder and can no longer be dismissed. And we have helped to establish Paine as the symbol of the possibility of democracy and the beacon which stands against elite aristocrat and autocratic rule. To completely reach our goal, Thomas Paine National Historical Association, starting this summer, will lead an international official collected works of Thomas Paine with some of the leading Paine scholars in the world. And next June, we will celebrate Thomas Paine Day with a symposium and festival of celebration of Paine scholars and free thought organizations and activists in New Rochelle, New York. You can go to www.thomaspain.org for accurate information and updates on the collected works, as well as original sources of the works of pain, FAQs, historic essays on pain, and de-attributed works. And it now has a link to original videos from Rod Bradford of The Truth Seeker. You should join us on Facebook, where hundreds of people from around the world are kept informed. I have a long quote from Paine, which sums up the current state of American society and politics and shows how relevant Paine still is today. Quote, 
there is a general and striking difference between the genuine effects of truth itself and the effects of falsehood believed to be truth. Truth is naturally benign, but falsehood believed to be truth is always furious. The former delights in serenity, is mild and persuasive, and seeks not the auxiliary aid of invention. The latter sticks at nothing. It has naturally no morals. Every lie is welcome that suits its purpose. It is the innate character of the thing to act in this manner and the criterion by which it may be known, whether in politics or religion. When anything is attempted to be supported by lying, it is presumptive evidence that the thing so supported is a lie also. And to that, I toast pain. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for co-sponsoring the celebration to honor the life and work of free thought hero and American founder, Thomas Paine. We hope that everyone's poured their favorite beverage by now and toasted Thomas Paine. A shared summer summary of his life is about to begin. The co-sponsors will share an interesting segment of Thomas Paine's life with their toasts. And I'm sure that you're gonna find it fascinating. You will also be meeting Zenos Fedrakis, who's going to show us the progress he's made in creating a seven foot statue of Thomas Paine. We will have a musical interlude before the question and answer segment begins. Make sure to jot down any questions in the question and answer section that come to you, your mind as you enjoy the life story of Thomas Paine. From this time forward, we'll just be using his first name, Thomas, in reference to our free thought hero. So let's start with Mandiza Thomas, the Vice President of the American Humanist Association. Thank you once again, Melissa. Thomas was born in Thetford, England on January 29th, 1737. Presently, there is a golden statue of Thomas in the middle of the Thetford Town Square. Please join me in raising my glass to toast his birth. Thomas's mother, Frances, was Anglican. His father, Joseph, was a Quaker. At age eight, after a stroll in the garden, Thomas wrote his first poem after having found a dead crow on the ground. Here lies the body of John Crow, who once was high, but now is low. Ye brother crows take warning all, for as you rise, so must you fall. Throughout his childhood, Thomas questioned the validity of Bible story told to him by his parents. As a young student, his, his interests were science and poetry. He also found that the Quaker religion was, and this is a direct quote from a reflective older Thomas. Though I reverence philanthropy, I cannot help smiling at the conceit that if the taste of a Quaker could have been consulted at the creation. What a silent and drab color creation it would have been. Not a flower would have blossomed, its gaieties, nor a bird permitted to sing. His father's business included stay making and sewing together sails for huge ships. Perhaps this is what made Thomas hunger for adventures at sea. His parents hoped that Thomas would carry on the family business. In fact, at age 13, with no hope of advancements to the universities, Thomas left school to become an apprentice stay maker in his father's shop. But at age 18, he left his house to enlist as a pirate on a ship named the Terrible. The Terrible was commanded by a fellow named Captain Death. His parents disapproved of his plan to work at sea and fortunately, Thomas's father arrived at the dock and stopped him from enlisting just in time. Thomas learned later on that the voyage, the very voyage he would have been on, the ship sank in a storm and all hands were lost. Thanks to his father, Thomas escaped death on the high seas. Two years later, at age 20, Thomas served as a privateer on a ship called the King of Prussia where he learned that he was prone to seasickness. Always tried to seek knowledge, Thomas traveled to London to pursue his studies. Soon, Thomas moved to Sandwich, England, where he married Mary Lambert. 
both Mary and child died during birthing difficulties. They had only been married for one year. Heartbroken, Thomas turned to, returned to Thetford and studied for the excise exam. Having passed this exam, Thomas was eventually assigned to the town of Lowes in 1768. In Lowes, Thomas became a regular debater at the White Hart Tavern, winning the tavern's headstrong prize many times, all while working as an excise man. The job involved the collection of taxes for the crown. Excise men were notoriously underpaid and bribes were commonplace as a way for excise men to make ends meet. Thomas saw the unfair pay as a social injustice and a cause to remedy. Voicing his opinion often, he was soon selected as a spokesperson for the grievances of excise men. In that role, Thomas became an advocate for public employee rights before the creation of unions. His brilliant presentation of grievances was presented to parliament, but he lost his job as a result because his trip to London was considered abandonment of his post. Fortunately, Benjamin Franklin recognized Thomas as a great writer, speaker, and revolutionary. He foresaw a bright future for Thomas Paine. While in Lowe's, Thomas married his second wife, Elizabeth, in 1771. He helped the Olive family operate a tobacco shop, but the arrangement did not work well. Since Thomas and Elizabeth had separated around the time Franklin suggested a move to the colonies, he made it the decision to relocate. At age 37, on November 30th, 1774, Thomas arrived in Philadelphia with a letter of introduction written by Franklin. He had traveled from England to Philadelphia aboard a ship named the London Packet. When he arrived in Philadelphia, he was near death. He had contracted typhus during an epidemic that he fell five crewmen. At the Philadelphia dock, a doctor was summoned to the ship when it was discovered that Thomas could not move from his cabin bed. Dr. Keesley arrived and he was the first to see that Thomas was carrying a letter of introduction from Benjamin Franklin. The physician immediately sent his servants for a sedan chair and Thomas was carried off the ship. He was taken to the doctor's home for treatment. The voyage had, the voyage had caused many medical problems, but Thomas survived and soon began his career as an editor for the Philadelphia Magazine. I raise my glass to toast Thomas Paine's recovery and the beginning of his illustrious publishing career. I now hand the duty of conveying the next portion of Thomas's life to Tom Flynn from the Center for Inquiry. Thank you, Mandisa. As editor of the Philadelphia Magazine, Thomas wrote controversial articles, such as a condemnation of dueling and the tradition of using undeserved titles of nobility. Through his editor position, Thomas advanced a growing progressive view in the magazine using articles and poetry that furthered the sentiments of American rights. For example, he published essays against British colonialism and advocated for preparations to declare war with England. Thomas also published his Liberty Tree poem, which led to the parting of ways with the owner of the magazine in July, 1775. Soon Thomas penned the famous pamphlet, Common Sense. His words were a rallying cry for colonists to fight for independence. Thomas donated all of the proceeds from the sale of Common Sense to help finance the Revolutionary War. As the war proceeded, Thomas continued his inspirational writings, penning a series entitled The American Crisis Papers. There is a large statue of Thomas Paine located in Morristown, New Jersey, that depicts him writing the American Crisis Papers. The statue is historically accurate, showing him writing on the top of a drum with his musket across his legs. The most famous of his quotations from the American crisis is, these are the times that try men's souls. 
the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. This example is why George Washington ordered that each new American crisis paper be read to the troops in their encampments. I raise my glass to toast the American crisis papers and in agreement with Joel Barlow, who stated, Washington's sword would have been wielded in vain had it not been supported by the pen of pain. As Thomas penned a total of 13 American crisis papers, he also served as a colonial soldier, a volunteer aide de camp, secretary for foreign affairs, and a clerk for the Pennsylvania Assembly. Sections of the American Crisis Papers were also printed in newspapers, and he was awarded an honorary master's degree by the University of Pennsylvania. In 1781, Thomas traveled to France with John Lawrence to secure financial aid for the American cause. That aid enabled victory for the colonists in their fight to reject the tyranny of the crown. In 1784, the government of the newly formed United States of America awarded Thomas land in New Rochelle, New York as a thank you for his services to the country. Because Thomas was always interested in science and engineering, he designed an iron bridge without piers, hoping to have it used over the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. He took a 13 foot long cast iron model to his friend, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin placed the model of the suspension bridge in his garden in 1786. Visitors arrived in droves to see the open to the public display. They walked on the model, stomped on it, and were amazed that the bridge could withhold even the weight of Benjamin Franklin. With much enthusiasm and endorsements, Thomas applied to build a bridge across the Schuylkill River. He was not awarded the contract, because the project demanded the use of 520 tons of iron. At the time, no American ironworks could produce such a large amount. Thomas traveled to England and then to France to present his iron bridge design to the Academy of Science. He was successful, and the Academy gave the design their stamp of approval. With renewed enthusiasm, Thomas took his model and design plans to the Royal Society of London. As the French scientists had, the scientists of the Royal Society also approved the bridge design. In 1788, Thomas returned to France to promote and sell his bridge design. He hoped to gain endorsements in France to attract financing in both America and England. He said, if I can succeed only in one contract in Europe, I shall be able to build the Schuylkill Bridge myself. Observing the civil unrest developing in France, Thomas once again returned to England, this time seeking financial support for his bridge design. A 110-foot model of the Iron Bridge was built in 1790 and put on public display on Paddington Green in London. For the price of a shilling, one could walk across the bridge, drag weights across it, and stomp on it as hard as possible. The attraction became one of the top wonders in London. His iron bridge was later constructed in 1796 over the River Ware at Sunderland, England. Thomas gained nothing monetarily, nor would he ever see the bridge. My time for this segment doesn't allow me to tell you about all of his other inventions, so I encourage you to learn more about Thomas's smokeless candle, his steam engine technology, gunpowder, and so much more. Let's toast to the ingenuity of Thomas Paine, as well as his insightful writings. I'm pleased to pass the life story of Thomas Paine to the next presenter, Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Thank you, Tom. 
While Thomas had hopes of building bridges in the United States, England, and France, he continued writing books that called for social, economic, and government reforms. In 1791, Thomas wrote Part I of The Rights of Man. It was published by both Joseph Johnston and J.S. Jordan in London. Within three months, it was translated into French and published in Paris. The Rights of Man includes 31 articles arguing that political revolution is permissible when a government does not safeguard the natural rights of its people. In Part 1, Thomas recommended that men over 21 should have the vote, that the House of Lords should be abolished, and that taxation should be graduated and based on wealth. He also advocated the introduction of old age pensions, not as a matter of grace and favor, but as a matter of right. Not forgetting the women, he also advocated for maternity grants. A year later, in 1792, Part Two of The Rights of Man was published. Part Two developed concrete measures for political reform and proposed novel concepts, such as political representation and tax reform to benefit the poor. Three months after the publication of Part Two of The Rights of Man, King George III of England issued a proclamation against sedition, subversion, and riot. Within days, because the rights of man advocated for parliamentary reforms, the king signed a sedition trial summons for Thomas Paine. The story is that the king's soldiers were sent to arrest Thomas and followed his trail to the docks only to find that the ship with Thomas aboard was sailing away toward France. Thomas had been told of the arrest warrant by his friend and the famous poet, William Blake. This is the same Blake who wrote so hauntingly of our mind-forged manacles. I raise my glass and toast the friends of Thomas Paine, then and now. Fleeing to Calais was appropriate because despite not being able to speak French, Thomas was elected to the French National Convention. In France, Thomas was quickly befriended by many philosophers and revolutionaries, including a lawyer named Maximilien Francois Marie Isidore de Robespierre, later known simply as Robespierre, who would later become the leader of the Reign of Terror. Thomas's sedition trial was held in England because the English government worried about the possibility that the French Revolution would spread. His trial in absentia was an attempt to suppress works that espoused radical philosophies. Thomas's book, The Rights of Man, was duly targeted because it advocated the right of the people to overthrow their government. Thomas was represented in absentia by Thomas Erskine, a noted lawyer and orator who was severely criticized by government supporters in the months leading up to the trial. At the trial, the prosecution argued that Paine's work served only to inflame the populace and distribute radical ideas to those without the experience to understand them in context. Erskine provided brilliant defense arguments. For instance, he said that books like The Rights of Man actually help improve the government by highlighting its weaknesses, and it couldn't be seditious if it was published in good faith. Erskine also argued that The Rights of Man carried on the honorable English tradition of political philosophy that included the writings of John Milton, John Locke, and David Hume. Despite his defense about the freedom of the press and free thinking, the prosecution didn't even have to rebut Erskine's arguments. The jury informed the judge that they had already decided Thomas Paine was guilty. The verdict was seen by the government as legitimizing their repression of radicalism. For most of the 1790s, Thomas lived in France, and he became deeply involved in the French Revolution. In 1792, despite not being able to speak French, Thomas was elected to the French National Convention. The Girondists regarded him as an ally. Consequently, the Montagnards, especially Robespierre, came to regard him as an enemy. Paine himself joined no faction and kept an independent revolutionary stance, at times criticizing both groups. In 1793, Thomas was arrested for treason due to his opposition to the death penalty, most specifically the mass use of the guillotine and the execution of Louis XVI. On his way to prison, Thomas was able to convince the gendarmes who had arrested him in the middle of the night to stop at the house of Joel Barlow. Thomas gave the first part of his newest book, The Age of Reason, to Joel and requested that it be given to a printer. The captain of the gendarmes grabbed the pages and quickly thumbed through them. He allowed the transaction to take place because he thought that the text was merely a religious essay, not a political one. And he even commented that the work will do much good. Part one of The Age of Reason 
was published in the early months of 1794, as Thomas languished in a prison cell at the Luxembourg prison. His French friends Nicolas Bonneville and his wife Marguerite Brazier Bonneville worried daily about Thomas's safety. It's an appropriate time to pass the story of Thomas Paine's life off to Margaret Downey, since she has portrayed Madame Bonneville at school assemblies, walking tours, and celebration dinners. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, I very much enjoy portraying Madame Bonneville, even though I do not speak French. Nicolas Bonneville was a French bookseller, printer, journalist, and writer. He was also a political figure of relevance at the time of the French Revolution, and this is why he and Thomas connected so well. The friendship he had with Thomas provided many writing and publishing opportunities, as well as happy times. During his imprisonment, Thomas continued to work on part two of the Age of Reason, and somehow remained calm and resolute that he would soon be free. A fellow detainee wrote the following about having been imprisoned with Thomas. And here is where I start the quote. His cheerful philosophy under the certain expectation of death, his sensibility of heart, his brilliant powers of conversation, and his supportive vein of wit rendered him a very general favorite of his companions of misfortune, who found a refuge from evil in the charms of his society. He was the confidant of the unhappy, the counselor of the perplexed, and to his sympathizing friendship, many a devoted victim in the hour of death confided the last cares of humanity and the last wishes of tenderness." End quote. Thomas fell ill during the latter part of his 10-month and 9-day imprisonment. At one point, his illness caused him to be incapacitated. Since he was confined to his bed of straw, his cell door was left open. One night, the prison guards received a list of names of those who would be executed the following day. They found Thomas's cell and in chalk marked his door with an X, not noticing that the door was facing the wrong way. The next morning, just before the prisoners were taken from their cells to be executed, Thomas's door was shut, causing the chalk mark to face the inside of the cell rather than the outside. Fortunately, the guards not seeing a chalk mark ever took Thomas to the execution scaffold. I raise my glass to toast that Thomas Paine escaped death once again. <clears throat> After many letters and pleas of, for help from Thomas, the United States Minister to France and future President James Monroe used all of his diplomatic connections to obtain a release for Thomas in November 1794. His release took place a few months after that chalk incident. James and his wife Elizabeth nursed Thomas back to health in their home. Now that is where he finished part two of the Age of Reason. After his recovery, Thomas began to reside in the Bonneville household in Paris. He lived with the Bonnevilles for five years paying a small rental fee to occupy a modest sleeping room. The Bonnevilles accepted him as part of their family and even named their youngest son after Thomas. In my research about Madame Bonneville, I discovered what she wrote about Thomas living in their home. I'll relate a few of her sentiments as it paints a colorful picture of Thomas. Madame Bonneville said, he kept quite busy, either reading, writing, or engaging in some mechanical invention. He also, she said, loved to entertain visitors, chat with them, sing to them, and drink brandy with them. Madame Bonneville recalled that Thomas was gracious to all of his callers, except when they began to bore him. Now, during this time, 
Thomas became an honorary member of the Society of United Irishmen. Thomas enjoyed going to the Irish coffee house on the Rue des Contes to eat, drink, sing songs, and offer toasts to the liberation of Ireland. Hear, hear. Madame Bonneville recalled a spring day in the year 1800 when she answered a knock on the door and discovered Napoleon Bonaparte standing there wanting to visit with the great Thomas Paine. She ushered him into the parlor and soon Thomas arrived to speak with Napoleon. During that visit, Napoleon disclosed that he slept with the rights of man under his pillow. He also stated that there should be erected in every town in the universe a golden statue of Thomas Paine. Indeed, there is a golden statue of Thomas Paine located in a park across from the Settee University. This even though at one time Thomas had occupied a prison cell in Paris. Thomas went from trying to influence Napoleon in 1798 to denouncing him as a charlatan and ruthless autocrat in 1802. In 1802, Thomas left for the United States. He returned to America in a ship sent by Thomas Jefferson. Madame Bonneville and her three children soon followed. Her husband, Nicholas, had been arrested and the family had no means of support. Madame Bonneville and her three boys settled comfortably with Thomas at his home in Bordentown, New Jersey. There, she taught French as her profession. This is where I turn the life story of Thomas Paine over to Gary Burton from the Thomas Paine National Historical Association. Coincidentally, Gary also lived in Bordentown and he will tell you more about the statue of Thomas Paine that he commissioned for the city. Gary. Thomas traveled to the White House to dine and consult with Jefferson often. Well, which enraged the hysterical Federalists. Payne went immediately to work writing the first three of the eight letters to the citizens of the United States. My quote from my introduction earlier is from this third letter. These letters exposed Adams and the Federalists for their rule by oligarchy and the controversy in norms of government rule exists still today. In 1779, Thomas decided to purchase property in Bordentown because his close friend, Joseph Kirkbride, resided there. Thomas lived with Joseph while he built prototypes of his bridge. The house on Church Street there that Thomas purchased is still standing today, although he never lived in it. In 1995, a statue of Thomas was erected on a spot overlooking the Delaware River next to the Kirkbride house where his horse Button once grazed. Thomas moved to New York City, leaving Madame Bonneville and children in Bordentown with the Kirkbride family. In New York, he was greeted with celebratory dinners by workmen's associations and free thinkers. During the many celebrations, Thomas was often toasted then and on his birth date and later on the date of his death with the following words. We raise our glass for Thomas Paine. May each returning anniversary witness the extension of the principles for which he contended until the rights of man shall be universally admitted and the age of reason triumph over superstition and priestcraft and kingcraft shall be known no more. After a few months, Thomas took residence in Connecticut, where he found a suitable school for the two youngest Bonneville boys, the oldest having returned to France. During these last years between returning to America and his death, Thomas had his most prolific period of writing. The farm in New Rochelle, New York, that the government had given to Thomas in 1784, soon called to him. He decided to make his home there, even though the cottage was small. The cottage was built to house farm workers, but it suited Thomas's needs well. In New Rochelle, Thomas wrote many important works between the years 1804 and 1806. During that time, he corresponded regularly 
with Thomas Jefferson and others concerning the Louisiana Purchase. Thomas was adamant that slavery must not spread to Louisiana. Between writing, Thomas worked on his farm. He kept the usual farm animals, but he soon discovered that farming was simply not for him. In New Rochelle, Thomas experienced a frightening incident concerning his hired farmhand, Christopher Derrick. Shortly after Christopher was fired for drunkenness, the former employee attempted to kill Thomas by shooting at him as he sat writing at his desk. The shot missed, no doubt because Christopher was drunk. Taking pity, Thomas never filed charges against him. At age 68, Thomas mostly enjoyed spending his time in New York City. He stayed in New York City as often as possible, staying with his many friends. Among his New York friends were Thomas Emmett, the Irish revolutionary, Willett Hicks, the Quaker leader, John Henry Jarvis, the artist, John Fellows, a leading free thinker, and many other notables. While being social, Thomas continued to write dozens of articles for the newspapers. He wrote primarily about politics and scientific matters. In the summer of 1806, Thomas suffered his first stroke. Within two months, he had recovered enough to begin writing again. As the 1806 voting day approached, Thomas traveled back to New Rochelle, specifically to cast his ballot. Payne was denied the right to vote by Elijah Ward, a man whose father and brothers had served with the British during the revolution. Elijah claimed that Thomas was not an American and refused to accept his ballot. Not allowing the great Thomas Paine to vote is pure irony of all citizens. He did more than anyone to establish that concept of universal voting rights. Thomas described himself as a citizen of the world that day, but the truth is that being a resident of the United States and service in the army were all that was required to vote. After having experienced the assassination attempt and the voting rejection, Thomas decided to move permanently to Greenwich, New York, now Greenwich Village, in late 1806. Madame Bonneville and her sons were also living in Greenwich and Thomas settled not too far from her location. Payne suffered a series of strokes and by November of 1808 needed constant care. He wrote his will, leaving the New Rochelle farm to Madame Bonneville and her sons, as well as money to a few friends. At this time, in late 1808, he wrote his last letter to Thomas Jefferson and signed it from, quote, a slave, close quote. He did so to denounce Jefferson for the practice of slavery. By the way, Thomas Paine was the first person to demand reparations for all slaves when he freed when freed, dating back to the year of 1781. Thomas died peacefully at 8 a.m. in the morning on June 8, 1809, after weeks of extreme pain. Unlike the rumors that ran amok after his death, and I still persist to this day, Thomas did not die poor, forgotten, or abandoned. He never lost his mental strength, rejecting attempts by ministers to flip him to, quote, superstitious nonsense, close quote as Payne would say. The burial took place the next morning before any papers could carry the news. Consequently, the burial was attended by just a few people. Thomas was buried at the entrance to his farm, an area where he once said would be a pleasant place to be buried. There was only one small plaque indicating where the grave was located and the plaque has errors on it. The Thomas Payne National Historical Association plans on recreating the grave as he specified. The gravestone is part of the TPNHA collection at Iona Co College, and we hope it will be placed on the Payne Cottage grounds as part of a Thomas Payne International Historical Center encompassing the Payne Memorial Building, which is our headquarters, the Payne Cottage, the Payne Monument, and the grave site. And now back to you, Melissa. Thank you, Gary. I raise my glass to toast the life of Thomas Paine and thank all of you for telling us his life story. But the story doesn't end at his death or his burial. For many years, journalist and Englishman William Cobbett wrote extensively against Thomas Paine's political and religious ideas. After he read 
Thomas's essay entitled The Decline and Fall of the English System of Finance, William recanted his disdain. In 1819, William, his son, and one other man dug up Thomas's coffin and stole away to have it shipped to England. The intent, William said, was to exhibit the bones, build a shrine, and erect a bronze statue of Thomas Paine, as you do. William could not raise the funds for his endeavor, and his son inherited the bones in 1835. When that son declared bankruptcy, the whereabouts of the bones became questionable. Some say that a day laborer kept them, but lost them in some unknown manner. Some say that the bones are buried on the grounds of the Cobbett's home in an unmarked grave. The whereabouts of Thomas Paine's missing bones is irrelevant when, we, when one realizes that he was a citizen of the world. This leads us to how we might further honor this great founder and free thought hero. I'm pleased to introduce sculptor Zenos Vadrakis. He's joining us from his studio in Glenside, Pennsylvania, where he's working on a seven foot high statue of Thomas Paine. Good evening, Zenos. Uh, good evening, thank you. Um, I could say that I have uh, his bones here, Tom Paine's, but uh, uh, Tom Paine was uh, five nine and this is only uh, five five. So uh, can you hear me all right? I hope you can, I'm coming live to you. You and, sound great. Um, okay, great. Can you see me also? Yeah, we and sure can. can. See, see and we can Tom. see Tom. We can see great. Big Tom. Great. Years ago, Margaret Downey told me that she thought it was important to have a Thomas Paine sculpt, uh, sculpture in Washington, D.C. And she tried to do that. She got very close to making that happen. And she could tell you more about that. And actually had property set aside for her there. And um, it didn't happen. And um, we talked about the possibility of trying to do it again. And it was interesting to me to hear Jamie Raskin, Congressman Raskin and Andy Laurie both talk about the importance of having uh, Thomas Paine sculpture in Washington, DC, even though there are some in other locations, the importance of Washington, DC and Thomas Paine's contribution to the creation of America and democracy. And I think especially in these times of rising autocracy and racism, anti-Semitism, religious bigotry, that uh, that kind of encroaching darkness needs the, the beacon of light, the enlightenment giant uh, of uh, Thomas Paine. And uh, so it'd be great to have, I think, a statue there. I'm thrilled to be involved in this. Um, I could see, this is a small model. Uh, when you're working on a sculpture, you begin with something it's almost like if you're building a house and you have a blueprint. This is a kind of a quick sketch that I did. And um, so um, if it goes in the Capitol or outside the Capitol, as uh, Congressman Raskin was, was saying was possible, um, it would be appropriate for both inside or out. Um, if it was outside, it would be nice to have a chair and a desk and maybe have him uh, rising from, uh, from his work table. But I could see quotes from Payne would be very not just appropriate, but would be meaningful to have on a base or nearby because he was a man of words. And um, there's so many, uh, obviously that's what he was known for, he, that he uh, turned the opinion of, uh, of, of many American uh, citizens to uh, the idea of independence. Uh, but also for us, his ideas of um, that buttress reason and science are really um, relevant now. So I wanted to show you that I've, we've, we've come a long way already. I've gone from this small model, which is a rough sketch. Now this is still a sketch. This is a big one at this point. And this is a long way from being finished. You see, I have uh, the skeleton to, to help me somewhat. I have a costume that was, that's historically accurate there um, and uh, had made, you can see Ben Franklin back here, who was another enlightenment figure who, whose history is tied with uh, Thomas Paine. And um, it's going to take a while, but I think um, that'll give us time to find a, and, uh, a location in Washington that will uh, accept this. And um, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think that he is, he's much needed in this time. And um, you've already heard a lot about Thomas Paine, and um, I'm uh, excited about uh, answering your questions later if you want to hear more. Thank you so much. Uh, to help fund the Thomas Paine Statue 
project, please visit the Thomas Paine Memorial Association's website. We're going to talk more about the statue after a short break. We're pleased to present the Freedom From Religion Foundation's co-president, Dan Barker. He wrote a song based on the words of Thomas Paine and will sing us into a five minute break. If you're leaving the area of your computer, we recommend that you turn up the volume so you can hear it from other areas of your location. Welcome, Dan. The world is my country to do good is my religion no prophets no priests no bible for me my mind is my own church we are all one human family wanting love fairness and freedom this simple creed is all that we need to enjoy peace on earth country to do good is my religion no prophets no priests no Bible for me my mind is my own church we are all one human family wanting love fairness and freedom this simple creed is all that we need to enjoy peace on earth. Well, 
I'm then contented with my laws I can no happy be Neither the world I'm sure has got so rich a man as me Then send no fiery chariot down to take me off from him Believe me on this heavenly ground My prayer is common sense And lovers choose another plan I mean no fault to find Welcome back, everyone. I'm sure that you all enjoyed Dan Barker's song, The World is My Country. And of course, if you wish to make a donation to the Thomas Paine's Culture Project, please visit thomaspainmemorial.org slash donation. We got it. Right. This song is available uh, for purchase through the Freedom from Religion Federation or Foundation's website at ffrf.org. I will be reading questions that I've received between any live questions that the audience members may have. So if you're sending us a written question through the chat, please provide your uh, email address so that we can contact you with an answer if we run out of time. Um, but honestly, the best way to submit questions for this is to just go ahead and operate through the question and a question and answer function through the bottom of the chat or the bottom of your Zoom panel. If anyone would like to speak, you can raise your hand through the raise hand function. Um, and I will acknowledge you one by one. And I'll do that by permitting you to speak. Okay. Remember that you can answer, you can ask the speakers your question. You can ask any of the speakers your question, or you can ask a general question that one of the speakers will address. When I see someone who would like to speak, I'll spotlight them and they will be unmuted. Okay. So. Do I see, do I see any hands up in the chat or let's go right to the Q and A. Okay. Um, of those involved in the American revolution, this question is from uh, James Downer, by the way. Um, of all those who were, were involved in the American revolution, who in the modern world are most like them today? Tom Paine as Christopher Hitchens, Ben Franklin as a philosophical Neil deGrasse Tyson. Do you feel like there's an analog? Does anyone feel like there's an analog to um, any of our founders in today's public intellectuals? Does anyone have any thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll give my two cents. Right. Uh, Paine was one of the great intellectuals in history, so you're not going to you're not going to find an equivalent. Um, and his his humanity and uh, poetic soul is unmatched as well. He's a, he's someone who can who can tie uh, uh, a living humanism to politics, and uh, um, the things we hold dear, at least the things that Democrats hold dear is was expressed by pain and all we can do now is repeat them uh, we can't invent anything else beyond that at this point right so no like i tend to agree there's not there's not uh no one is is just like screaming out uh to me as far as who, who might be a good um successor unfortunately um <laughs> <clears throat> perhaps it'll be Jamie Raskin. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, so moving on to a question from Christopher Raycraft. Considering religious institutions have a high amount of influence in legislation, for example, Proposition 8 in California, where the Mormon church took out countless anti-same-sex marriage television ads, what negative consequences might taxing religious institutions have to ensure that they pay their fair share for representation. I, I wish Thomas Paine had addressed that question when he was alive. Pardon my loss of voice. I'm fighting a, a bit of bronchitis now. It's all right. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Um, do we feel like, what do, what do we think about what negative consequences could come from taxing the church? Well, you'd probably put a number of churches out of business, but uh, uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a negative thing. I think the uh, I think the larger and better established congregations would find a way to muddle through anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I'm continually think back to a, an often quoted statistic from an article that 
ran a few years ago in uh, Free Inquiry magazine, uh, estimating the cost of church of tax exemption for churches at something like $71 billion a year. Wow. And it's probably gone up since then. Uh, so I think one question is, on the one hand, maybe a few fewer churches. On the other hand, what, what better could be done with that $71 billion or whatever the total is now? Uh, to me, I think it's a pretty easy, uh, uh, pretty easy decision, but uh, I, I don't get to make those decisions. Darn it. Okay, so my next question is from Joey Cody and it's for Zenos. Zenos, what materials are you using for your sculpture? Okay, uh, the materials I'm using besides my brain Mm -hmm. uh, it, you have to have some ideas first so that it, and and some sense of his history so it goes through your fingertips it comes out here this is an old plastiline it's about 100 years old some of it was used to make the lincoln memorial and various other sculptures in the past is when they've died it's been passed down to other sculptors when i die it'll get passed down to other people got a list and um Unless I outlive them and have to make a new list continually but anyway the tools are all handmade again they're passed down and then many of the lessons that I've learned are also passed down. So that I studied with someone who studied with someone who studied with Rodin and so on. So that got passed down to me in a sense, not just tools and clay, but the, the um, method of sculpting has been passed down over. I mean, I don't know how you can go back probably to the Renaissance. It's, it's really continuous history. So I'm very, um, what should I say? It's just been great for me to have this tradition and to be working with tools that I know have uh, have been used in, in great monuments. What what is in ancient like um, hundreds of years old plasticine clay? Well, this plasticine is in hundreds. It's they used to use water clay, oh. and uh, a little, I think it was over a hundred years ago or so. Sculptors, you had to always keep it wet. For example, with Rodin. If, there were times, especially early in his career, when he didn't have heat in his studio and he had water clay and it would crack. It would freeze. It would crack. His, he would lose his sculpture. It would fall over. And so he got into a sort of a habit of having uh, people, um, his mistresses, different people keep it wet for him and kind of help him cover it with. Uh, and uh, he had a lot of sculptures, a lot of mistresses. But he um, but so there were sculptors who didn't who, who realized that if they put an oil in the clay instead of water. And this says that it would last. You don't have to, when I, I've gotten some of this clay that's 20, 30, 40, and I set up to a hundred years old or so, and it's just as soft, right? It always stays soft. And it's, it, it's an old Italian recipe and they make it the way they make their cheeses and other foods, the uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, that kind of thing where you're there, it's, it's aged and it comes from a certain land in Italy that has a lot of volcanic ash. I talked to a sculptor who's made a lot of monuments. He's dead now um, in Normandy Beach and other places. And he had he's, he talked to others in Italy who made it. And it's a secret formula. They don't make any more. They put their secret away. But it, it's it's um, it can't be reproduced very easily. And I, I've known people who run sculpture companies tried to reproduce it. I guess it's like trying to reproduce a great wine or something. You have to have that land. And you have to have the volcanic ash that's in that land from, you have to have the, uh, the flowers, everything else that's in there and have that earth. And then you, 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 you squeeze olives and the residue left over, you put it into it and, and uh, you have to grind it up and store it and grind it up and store it. And it, it takes months and years just to make it like, like their cheeses, some of their cheeses. And um, not many person I talked to who tried to duplicate it had a scope with a large sculpture company said, Nobody wants to pay for that time and effort. You know, very few right. sculptors have, but this is like having a Stradivarius where you have the best tools. If you're a good musician, you having the best tools brings the most out in you and you're not obstructed by having a limited instrument. The only right. imitation is your own imagination. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that intriguing sure. look at your, like your materials and a bit of your process there. Thank you so much. Um, Bobby Vegas um, asks, what do you think that Thomas Paine would make of the malignant phenomenon of 45 and all that he represents? I cannot imagine that he'd be too pleased, obviously. Mm. What, would, what would Thomas Paine think about Trump? <laughs> he, he would be astonished and shocked 
Thomas Paine was such an honest person. He would never think of lying to gain prestige or to fool anyone. He was the most honest person in his writings. I wish I had known him, but just the way he lived his life was pure honesty. Thank you, Margaret. Does anyone else have any thoughts? I would add to that, that uh, the quote I gave earlier on in my introduction about lying and truth pretty much sums it up. And that's why I put that quote in there. An excellent choice. Yes, I'd All like right. to add that with uh, Payne's advocacy for economic justice reparations, that he would certainly be a staunch opponent against Trump. Who oh. clearly, um, you know, represents the elite and who doesn't, you know, who could give, uh, you know, who, who could care less about, you know, the underprivileged and, and working class. So certainly, mm -hmm. I think he would, he would definitely be a, a, a strong opponent. Thank you, Lisa. I think two of the voices that might most be missed in the case of Trump, uh, one of them, Christopher Hitchens, who perhaps could have survived to see Trump, and oh, what I would give to read what uh, he wrote about, would have written about Trump. <laughs> and much as it's not possible, uh, it would be amazing to read what would flow from the pen of Thomas Paine if he could have beheld 45 and all of the ways in which uh, 45 betrayed the American ideal, the American experiment, all of the things that Payne and the other founders fought for. Uh, it, would be, it would be a vindictive vitriol, very worth reading. Someone asked about the Bridges um, projects and uh, Thomas Paine did have a bridge built in England and he never saw it. And what was interesting is that he did manage to have a model of his bridge placed in London for people to walk across. I think it was a shilling, wasn't it, Gary? Mm -hmm. You could walk across the bridge that Thomas Paine designed and all the money went towards building the bridge. Um, I don't know what became of the model. I think the iron was melted down and used elsewhere. But no, he never had a bridge built over the Schuylkill River, unfortunately. In Philadelphia, I would love for us to have an effort to name some of the bridges that are already um, up in the Philadelphia area named after Thomas Paine. Maybe we could have, uh, instead of the twin bridges, we could have one named uh, Common Sense and the other uh, Rights of Man. <laughs> you know, can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm just thinking about the metaphor of, um, when you talk about Trump and how he divides, divided people and here um, with uh, Thomas Paine was a bridge builder and mm -hmm. he wanted to create bridges. There's a kind of metaphor there for bringing people sure. together and yeah, no, that's an excellent observation. Um, all of all of um, Payne's work could be considered a, a series of building bridges, correct? Yes, of all things for him to invent, there may have been something there that was deeper than just uh, this mechanical, could have, could have built something else. He, he loved working with inventions so much. He, he tried to invent a smokeless candle at one time. Um, something else gary what what was the other invention he had was something to do with guns gunpowder uh, oh, oh yes it was having to uh, do minimally the, the most significant thing he did i believe was that he sat with a uh, fulton and there was a guy right before fulton which i forget his name at the moment that they visited Payne and they had many long discussions on how to make a steam engine practicable so that was a major, I mean, Payne had his hands in every aspect of science as it existed back then. Uh, he helped uh, he helped the colonies create their own gunpowder. Uh, wrote, he wrote uh, for the newspapers and in instructing all the, the people in the colonies before the revolution 
um, to make their own gunpowder. And he, yeah. he worked on the chemistry for that. Uh, he worked on transportation issues. He worked on architecture. He worked, he was a Renaissance, Renaissance man. Like all the revolutionaries in the 18th century all had their hands on scientific uh, works. Yeah. So I have a question that is for everyone on our panel. And that is, what was your first encounter with Thomas Paine's writings slash ideas? I will go first. In my case, it was um, when I was at UCLA. Um, I mean, like I had certainly read in my public school um, comings and goings about that Thomas Paine was a person who existed and did great things, et cetera. But like we really got into it. Um, in university. Um, Margaret, when was your first experience with Thomas Paine and what, what did you read? At age six, 16, I read The Age of Reason mm. on a recommendation of my adopted uncle. And I was mesmerized because the words were exactly what I was feeling. So mm. it was as if Thomas Paine had read my mind and wrote everything down that I was thinking. So I became a fan back then, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I moved to Pennsylvania in 1991 that I discovered so little was um, in the city that recognized the importance of Thomas Paine. So I, I uh, connected with an 85 year old um, a teacher, a retired teacher who loved Thomas Paine as much as I did. And he and I worked diligently to get a historical marker put in place where common sense was written. We had um, the city recognize a plaza as Thomas Paine Plaza. We have a street named Thomas Paine. And we, I owe all of this to my friend, Mark Stone, he uh, is deceased at, at this time. Um, he would be so proud of the work we're doing now. And um, I think of him so often when I carry on with my work uh, honoring Thomas Paine because I'm honoring Mark Stone as well. Oh, Margaret, if, if you had your druthers, the whole place would be called Thomas Paine, huh? Um, Mandisa, where did you first um, hear the writing or the ideas of Thomas Paine? I actually became, I actually learned about Thomas Paine in elementary school that he had written Common Sense. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn about that when you, when you learn about, you know, the Revolutionary War and uh, those times. Um, I know for myself, um, many of us with, in the Black community do associate the founding fathers with being slaveholders. And yeah. that those, those rights did not extend to the enslaved Africans and their descendants. So um, it is a, um, and, and interestingly enough, going back to what Payne would have thought about Donald Trump, especially his comments regarding American history and how he feels like it's, you know, people are trying to revise history and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and people are trying to, I guess, um, disparage American history. Um, well, talking about, you know, slavery and, and institutional uh, practices against um, you know, the enslaved Africans and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure he would have rallied against that and, and rallied against uh, Trump with, with, with that slant. So uh, it was, it was uh, good to know and learn later on in my adult life that he was an abolitionist, that he was on the same page as people like John Brown, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and other anti, uh, you know, other anti-slavery, anti, -slavery, anti uh, you know, and, uh, you know, pro-human rights. Uh, so yeah. it, that was really, really great to learn in my adult life. But I did, I was made uh, very aware of Thomas Paine, even as a child. I'm from New York City, for those who are on this, uh, on this meeting from, uh, you know, from the area. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we got a chance to learn uh, about that. Sure. Yeah. Colonial history is a big part of the state history. How about you, Gary? Where did you, where did you first get your introduction to pain? Um, in graduate school, uh -huh. I majored in the history of political theory 
and I got got involved out of spite because they didn't mention Thomas Paine in the whole program. <laughs> so I vowed to uh, disprove all their antiquated ideas and we were pretty successful at it so far. All right. Tom, where did you get your first introduction to Thomas Paine? University of Toronto. No, all right, all right. Yeah. I went there for the political economy, but was sorely disappointed. <laughs> Tom, how about you? Well, I, uh, my experience was somewhat like Mandisa's. I learned about the, uh, uh, you know, Paine is the theorist of the American Revolution and uh, all of the favorite quotes from Common Sense, uh, probably in uh, junior high school. Uh, I only came to understand Paine as a free thinker and a religious rebel uh, much later after I discovered Ingersoll and discovered free thought. And uh, it was amazing. I was probably in my early 20s when I first read Rights of Man and how contemporary the thinking sounded. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, the, it was with the diction of the late 1700s, but many of the ideas still hold up today. And of course, that's true of so much of Paine's writing. He was, he was one of these universal thinkers, and he thought at such a level that uh, his prose still speaks to us today. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, uh, certainly the age of reason is, uh, you know, very much part of that heritage. But yeah, I, I came to it late. I, I plead guilty. <laughs> well, you know, at least you came. Um, Zenos, how did you come aware of Thomas Paine before you got ex uh, conscript conscripted for sculpting? Sure. I think like a couple others have said, probably in uh, elementary school, maybe a little later, uh, it was common sense because uh, of the brilliance of it and the uh, uh, but I think what was to me was been more important is as I've gotten older to learn more about his um, um, his enlightenment uh, concepts, his ideas and and his um, anti religious establishment ideas. That's that was important to me. His, his uh, champion of reason mm -hmm. and science and invention and all, all the rest. The uh, so it's been more for me. Not so much. It's not so much my, the first. Uh, um, reading of him, but this later understanding of who he was that's been important to me. And, and uh, that's why I'm so excited about being, being part of this project. So Zenos, um, piggybacking off the talk of your work, um, Patrick Hughes wants to know, what document do you intend Payne to hold in your sculpture? Are you gonna put top, uh, common sense in his paint, in his, in his hand? Um, yeah. What's that's gonna a good be question. Thing? Um, what do you think, Margaret? There's so many. I mean, if it was up to me, I would I would have probably something that would really champion uh, reason and science because I think that's that's so important. But um, and I could see that written elsewhere too. Um, I think it has to be about. Sometimes in in this uh, work, you have to be a little pragmatic and think, realize how much can you do and still get it done. Mm -hmm. um, there was more that I wanted to do with Clarence Darrow when we put that up in, uh, in um, at the where the scope shot took place that I didn't do because if I tried to do it I wouldn't have been able to put the sculpture at all, and right. uh, I wanted to have him standing on on uh, on dinosaur bones and pieces of, of geology, and so he'd stand on his argument, and uh, the person the people there told me um, it wouldn't they wouldn't allow it to go up in the in the town, so we had right. had to back off, so. You know, it depends. How much can you say? You find a really good quotation to put there rather than one particular document. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really fascinated that so many people have talked about elementary school because mm -hmm. um, this is the reason I conduct assemblies, Thomas Paine assemblies. And if you go to the Free Thought Society website, there's a section for Thomas Paine and if you uh, would like me to come to an elementary school, you can fill out an application. And we have a generous donor who gives us money to go to uh, various uh, elementary schools so that I can do this presentation. 
and I give gifts to the children. We dress in costume. We have a beautiful PowerPoint about the life of Thomas Paine. And children, especially in the sixth grade, when they're learning about mm -hmm. col colonialism, they are fascinated with the history that we just related to all of you adults out there. Just, you know, his, his exciting life and his close encounters with death, the children are mesmerized. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy doing that. And if you would like me to come to a school near you, please go to the Free Thought Society website and uh, download the application and we'll try to get it done. Yeah, you know what the the impact of a living a living history moment is is something that is unforgettable for kids. So definitely, if you live um, around uh, Margaret, there no, take her no, up no, on I it. Travel, I travel. You travel. All right. So she has um, she has uh, costumes and and the whole nine. So hopefully, if in you, fact uh, I delivered um, a Thomas Paine assembly in Urbana. Uh, Illinois and California and New Jersey. Wow. Um, yeah, all, all the all the schools that are named Thomas Paine, I have delivered presentations to. Amazing. All right. So, um, Zenos, we have another question yes. for you, um, yes. and that is a question about what, where you got your image of Thomas Paine's face, because this uh -huh. anonymous, the anonymous attendee here mentions yes. that it's unlike any other picture of Thomas Paine that they've ever seen. Okay, when he says, is he saying this is unlike or the one yeah. he, oh, yeah, this, well, this is still okay. in process. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take a while to develop uh, the, the likeness. He had kind of a large nose, I think. And I've looked at the paintings primarily. I don't, and uh, I think there's a mask that I've looked at. Mm -hmm. um, that gets pressed down with plaster and so on. So it's a little bit uh, harder to, to use, but, um, I think that um, I've had to rely heavily on the on the paintings, any drawings. I wish there was more. Sure. Um, it, it, it does make it difficult. Um, I have a, a, a knowledge of anatomy I and mean, we have just a skeleton. So I can fill in some things that I don't see in the in the paintings and drawings I know are there. The paintings that I've seen aren't let's say they're not the first rate artists. Mm -hmm. So that would be better if I had the best painters. And, and you know, in Washington, you have Houdon doing the sculpture or, or Ben Franklin, it was sculpted by Houdan. He was as good a portrait sculptor as there is. Um, and unfortunately um, that didn't happen here. So um, I have to try to put all these together, all the images. And I appreciate any, if there are any I don't have, I think I have quite a few. Some of them are back there. Um, and what I've done in some cases is flipped paintings. So I can kind of see the side, although people aren't symmetrical in their faces, mm -hmm. but at least it, it, it kind of extends the view a little bit. So I have, uh, sure. but, um, but and, and again, since there are so few images of him, it's gonna be hard for someone to argue with me too much about what he should look like if they, if they don't true. have, a, if they have an image and they argue with, then I'll take it and change it. I'd be happy to have it. But, Lovely. So. Uh, let me answer one other thing I've thought of, now that you've, you've talked about it, one thing that could go here is something that it's hard to argue with. And the, there was the, the quote, I think that Annie Laurie and, and Dan sang about the doing good is my religion or something that's just so, well, how do you argue with doing good? So maybe yeah. that would be a, an acceptable universal uh, statement. Oh, for that, for the, um, for, for the, the for, for perhaps document, the document in, in his hand. hand. Yes. yes. That yeah. would be an excellent choice. Okay, so for our panel, is it true that Thomas Paine was a deist? If so, why was it often considered, why was he often considered one of the fathers of skepticism and atheism? This is from Arnold Haynes. Well, Thomas Paine detested superstition hmm. and um, he uh, advocated for reason and enlightenment and in that way, we consider him a hero because he was ahead of his time uh, to come up with these writings that questioned authority, questioned tradition, mm -hmm. question revelation. Uh, and, and to me, you know, that, that's why he is my hero is that he was so ahead of his time. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no Charles Darwin yet. 
So he didn't have that to. Uh, True. If, he, if Charles Darwin had already written, which was 1859, the, the Origin of Species, I I would think he would have probably just been an agnostic or atheist. But Diderot was, I think, an atheist, and he was around that same time. So it's still possible, but mm -hmm. they didn't have that benefit yet. But, but deism is really quite lovely. It espouses that the language of God is nature. And so to, to observe and respect and honor nature was really honoring your God. And nature's God is repeated in many documents as the founding principle of the United States. So keep that in mind that deism is really about nature. Mm. There's no question in the uh, introduction, I mean, the, the very near the very beginning of the Age of Reason, uh, Payne says very explicitly that his goal in writing the book is to defend uh, real religion, for want of a better term, against superstition. And Payne explicitly expresses the fear that if superstition debases religion, that will lead people to atheism. Mm. Uh, now, that may have been Payne's intention, but uh, works have a way of taking on a life of their own. And in fact, The Age of Reason has probably made more atheists than any book in history with the possible exception of the Bible. Uh, <laughs> but certainly, certainly The Age of Reason was a, a devastating critique of traditional revealed Christianity. Uh, and on that and on that basis, and as Zeno says, there is the fact that uh, it was relatively difficult uh, to be an atheist, if one was very thoughtful uh, at that time, because scientific thinkers had no answer to the question, well, where did life come from? And it re we really were depending on Darwin to spread the idea that a naturalistic viewpoint could have an answer to that question. Uh, before that time, you see a lot of people who you feel pretty confident if they were born in our time or if they were born in the later 19th century, they would have been atheists. And mm -hmm. they fall a little short of that, but do much the same work. And certainly yeah. that's what Payne did with the uh, Age of Reason and did it brilliantly. I think there's one more thing about deism. At the time, the technology was such like uh, clock making, and people thought that that if there was a deity, maybe he wound up the universe like a clock and then he walked away. And you couldn't really uh, ask him in a prayer to change the laws of physics for you and so on, because he wasn't listening. He walked, so there wasn't a deity there. I think that was kind of, for a lot of people, I believe that was part of deism, but there wasn't, it was a kind of, kind of a clock mechanical concept that, you know, with each technology, we have other analogies, but uh, anyway, another thought. Do, now, do we know if Thomas Paine was initially um, somewhat opposed to um, like organized religion or did he deconvert? Do we know when? I, I think it started when he was a child mm -hmm. with all of his questioning. He thought the Quaker religion was dour and mm -hmm. depressing. Um, you know, he was very upset that he couldn't sing as a Quaker. Uh, and, you know, he, throughout his whole life, he enjoyed singing with people and to people, mm. uh, as documented by Madame Bonneville. Uh, he, he really enjoyed um, the voice of a human being. <clears throat> um, I want to tell people a little bit about Madame Bonneville. Uh, after Payne's death, um, there was such a thing as the National Enquirer. And that was people were trying to discredit Thomas Paine and his legacy. Uh, so they made up stories about Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. And Madame, Madame Bonneville's son was named after Thomas Paine. So of course, the nasty story was that um, Thomas Paine was actually the father of oh, Madame Bonneville's child. Well, this upset her greatly so she sued uh, and she won her lawsuit. At the time, she won $150. Uh, 
which in today's um, uh, assessment of that amount, she would have uh, sued and, and won a little over $2,000. So, you know, she was trying to get her reputation squared away and that of Thomas Paine. Thank you. Thank you for um, adding to our understanding of one of the major um, female protagonists of the Thomas Paine story. Um, I would like to acknowledge one of our folks here in the audience with their hands up. This is Klaus. Klaus Bukowski. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk, okay? Okay, so you're live. And you can unmute. unmute. Hi, Klaus. Klaus is with Atheist United in Los Angeles. And um, he comes to a lot of events. Uh, Klaus, are you, I think you're unmuted or, or, or you're muted. You need yeah, to unmute yourself. Or you'll unmute Marcus, yourself. you unmute him? I can just ask him to unmute and then he can unmute himself. So I've asked him to unmute. Is there and anyone else that would like to talk while we're waiting for Klaus? Sure there is. Um, so Klaus, if you, um, if you, I'm gonna go ahead and lower your hand, but if you come back to us, um, just go ahead and put it, put it back up and I'll come right back to you, okay? So go ahead and lower his hand. Okay. So, Peter, I'm coming to you now, okay? Peter Hall. All right, Peter Hall, so if you would like to speak to us, go ahead and okay. unmute your mic. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Yep, I've unmuted. Okay, all right. So, um, something I've always liked to focus on, I had mentioned before that I put up a, 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 a billboard talking about the fact that Christianity appeared to him as a species of atheism. And so I've always wanted to, to push that. I'm a pantheist myself. So, mm -hmm. I was, it, so it kind of feeds a little bit into the deist idea that the celebration of nature, that, that nature is simply a manifestation of God, that it's, it's all kind of connected. So I've always tried to say that, that I've always loved that idea that if you don't celebrate nature and embrace the world the way it is, you are the atheist. And so I go, so even though I don't really quite believe it, I kind of throw it back at him. This idea that what makes you think that you actually celebrate God? If you deny the reality of the world, then how can you say that you truly believe you know, in God? And so um, someone like a Thomas Paine is really inspirational for me, especially when I read The Age of Reason that, okay, I can go ahead and go after them as even somebody who or believes in God can go after the the Christians and the and the the Muslims and whoever about um, what truly is a celebration of God and and so um, I so really love Thomas Paine and the, the uh, especially the Age of Reason the first part is very much inspirational to me I think this is wonderful to have the thing going on today that I can be a part of. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, just go ahead and move down the line to one of our other folks with their hands up. This is Rosina and Saldo. Um, Rosina, I'm allowing you to talk now. And if you would like to speak, just go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Um, I'm uh, Rosina and Saldo, and I'm on the executive council of the Capital District Humanist Society out of Albany, New York. Uh, and like most organizations, we've been doing everything, not everything, but most everything via Zoom. And we had advertised one of our social events <clears throat> in our newsletter. Uh, we were gonna be watching the Humanist International Annual Report where they you know, have a lot of statistics and figures and explain what's happening with uh, religious uh, events around the world. And our newsletter goes to Humanist International and they asked if they could have somebody come uh, via Zoom to our social event, which of course was great. And I, you know, I'm, I don't have it in front of me. I think his name might have been Gary McClelland. At any rate, he brought up an interesting thing, which is that Humanist International is moving away from using the phrase religious freedom 
or the phrase freedom of religion. And when you think about it, the phrase freedom of religion or religious freedom sort of implies that religious folks have special freedoms that other people don't have. And that religion is somehow more valued or valid than any mm -hmm. other belief system. So there, where it makes sense and where it fits, they're using the phrase freedom of thought and belief, which kind of puts it, which could include religion, but it can include, include any system of thought and belief. So it kind of makes more of a level plane where religion is just one of many systems of thought and belief, as opposed to being mm -hmm. something special. I just wondered what the panelists thought about that or were aware of that or could see using that here. What do you think about that changing in terminology? I, I like it. I think it's very interesting. I, I think, you know, personally that religion is a delusion. So if we can substitute that word with something else, I'd be all for it. <laughs> and this has actually been a uh, uh, movement that's been ongoing for 15, maybe 20 years in Europe. It's uh, taken a little longer to take root here. Uh, there have been several phrases used, uh, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion or belief, uh, freedom of thought or belief is a, another very good one. But yes, it takes religion off the pedestal and treats mm. religion as one among many life stances that should all have the same position in the hierarchy of rights. And that's a big step forward. And of course, as we've been seeing in the last few years here in the United States, uh, if you let people steep long enough in this idea that uh, freedom of religion is somehow unique among freedoms, uh, you'll get people steaming into court and insisting that uh, uh, their rights are being trampled if the government doesn't endorse their religion. And we're now in a situation where going right up to the Supreme Court, uh, too much of the judiciary is willing to take this foolishness seriously. So yes, let's have freedom of conscience. Let's have freedom of religion or belief. Let's get religion off that pedestal. Yeah. yeah. I think Free that, thought that society. makes sense. <laughs> Um, I, I agree 100%. And, and I'm, this is why I'm glad that we have organizations like the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Mm. And the fact that we, as our, or, as our respective organizations, can redefine that narrative of what religious freedom is, and that it doesn't mean discrimination based on your religious beliefs. Um, certainly not lack thereof. So um, this is a fight that I think that will be continuous for a very long time, uh, similar to other systemic um, factors and other institutional factors. It is going to take time to, you know, to, to, uh, to actually drive into people's psyche what true religious freedom is mm -hmm. and also helping people to, you know, re you know redefining what it means and, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, it's going to take some time. It's not just going to go away overnight, but it's something that we all can continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you for your all, all of your input and thank you for the question. Um, next, I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, back into our Q&A section for a minute. I will come back to those of you with your hands up momentarily. Um, so if you just hang out for a little bit, I'll be right back. Um, Zenos, I do have a question for you about the final materials of your um of your um thomas sculpture what will what will be his final form well it won't be gold <laughs> it'll be bronze. <laughs> seems expensive yeah <laughs> yes it is expensive we can gold leaf it if if that was uh, if that seems appropriate uh, um well we we don't want to honor what <laughs> what bonaparte uh, had to say <laughs> you know sure. He was an but, and, and it probably would depend on where this is going to go, and that's where the, the problem right now is is, um, is is getting a location. Margaret had one at one time; she could tell you more about that for her project, and uh, but that had a time limit, and uh, so that's gone. That's one of the hardest things. Is actually it's it's not as much 
raising the money, it's the location. Get a good location. And then in some places, let's say it's in Washington, D.C., you have to go through art commissions, which I did for another project. I did a uh, Air Force Memorial that's in Arlington, a National Air Force Memorial. We had to go through various uh, uh, art commissions. Uh, besides that, you have to have money set aside. You have to raise a lot more money than just creating the sculpture. You have to have money to, they insist on you taking care of this, having money set aside so that the interest on, on the money you have pays for its maintenance. Mm. Uh, but they don't want to make, uh, maintain it, you know, the, 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 um, the District of Columbia and so on. So it, it gets a little complicated. It really depends on where it would go. And so once, and, and that's something that uh, Congressman uh, Raskin said he would help us with, which would be great if he could. Um, and he said he would like to see it somewhere in the vicinity of the, of the, uh, of the Capitol, which would be after what the, the Capitol went through recently, it certainly needs uh, somebody to represent reason Absolutely. when you had such a uh, unreasonable uh, terrorist uh, group of people attack the Capitol and American democracy. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, and it would it would just be lovely to see in the Capitol. I'm a big fan of Washington. Yes. Well, you know, lots of times you have congressmen stand in front of a sculpture, like especially if they're Democrats, they'll stand in front of Will Rogers, which is great. He was, you know, but he's not. It wouldn't it be wonderful if they could stand in front of a man of reason, truly, like Tom Paine, and make their comments and have Tom Paine looking over their shoulder to make sure that they stay, you know, uh, reasonable and uh, in, in their uh, in their and their ideas, so. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have a question for the panel. Um, I've gotten it from a couple of different people so far. And that is for a beginner looking to get into the works of Thomas Paine, where do we start? Where does one start when we're starting to go through it? What, do you, what is your recommended first hit for a Thomas Paine reading? Well, um, I've read so many biographies of Thomas Paine and Gary Burton was the one that enlightened me about some of the authors would get things wrong. So um, I'm gonna let him recommend the best uh, biography of Thomas Paine. And, well, and, and not biography, but like his work. Oh, like his the work. work of Thomas Paine, yeah. Oh yeah, well, anything he wrote is worth studying. But if someone really would like to get into a biography, I think Gary could recommend the best one. A, a very good book is written by Jack Fruckman, uh, very thick with political information. Um, there's a handy little book that I keep at my bedside. It's called The Atheist Bible. And there's a section called The Book of Thomas. And it has wonderful quotes from Thomas Paine. So mm -hmm. That's kind of a fun book to have in your library. Mm. Definitely. One of the fascinating things about Paine, uh, he, he really served the revolutionary cause as a, a master pamphleteer. So he understood yeah. brevity mm. and he understood clarity. So as a result of that, he's remarkably approachable and his works uh, tend to be refreshingly short. Uh, so I'd say if you want to read Paine on the revolution, uh, just go ahead and read Common Sense. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to read Paine on religion, uh, go ahead and read The Age of Reason Part One. They're not heavy lifts. You'll be amazed at how fresh they seem for mm -hmm. something that was written in the revolutionary era. Mm -hmm. And they're highly, highly accessible. You know, the pain is not someone who you need an expert to interpret for you. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's definitely true. Um, we we appreciate um, we appreciate a founder who understands brevity. Um, now, um, I have a question from Victor Madison, who asks: Could someone comment on Paine's discourse on the existence of God? delivered to the Society of Theophilanthropists at Paris, January 16th, 1797. This is highly specific. A quotation from that or uh, presentation reads, religion has two principal enemies, fanaticism and infidelity, or that which is called atheism. The first requires to be combated by the by reason and morality and the other by natural philosophy, the existence of a God in 
is the first dogma of theophilanthropists. So does anyone know anything about this particular um, oration? This is highly specific. Are you gonna I'm also up? curious what Payne had for lunch that day. Maybe. Yeah, me too, frankly. Well, actually, Thomas Paine had considered starting that type of religion. Isn't that true, Gary? I'm the sorry, I'm answering the, another question about collected works. Uh, the um, say that again, I wasn't listening. I, oh, I, say I'm, that again? So re repeat the religion that he was talking about, theophily. Yeah, so um, he's, uh, Thomas Paine delivered to the Society of Theophilanthropists at Paris on 16 January, 1797, religious as, and, and I'm sorry, they just want to know just any, anything that you happen to know about this particular oration where, where Thomas said, religion has two principal enemies, fanaticism and infidelity, or that which is called atheism. The first requires to be combated by reason and morality and the other by natural philosophy. The existence of a God is the first dogma of the Theophilanthropist. And this is from religious and theological works of Thomas Paine um, collection. I, I had, I had, I answered that question directly to the person. Um, uh, okay. Payne was a deist. Mm -hmm. Payne was a deist and um, um, uh, there was a famous German philosopher who said deism is an easy way to get rid of religion. Mm. And uh, uh, it was a major step. I mean, when you think of the enlightenment, Payne, Payne was an enlightenment thinker like most mm -hmm. of the 18th century revolutionaries, uh, wedded to science. Uh, he applied Newtonian concepts, the Newtonian revolution to government. And that's what made it so revolutionary. Sure. So mm -hmm. when he talks in terms of atheism, mm -hmm. being against atheism, um, he's, he's approaching it from the deist perspective of um, <clears throat> if there is a God, uh, then it's in nature, like Margaret had said before. Sure. So that's where he's coming from from that so absolutely and I, i'm answering another person directly but i want to send it to everybody on that people are asking about complete uh paying works if you want to read the complete collection there is none this is why we are doing collected works project um give us five years and we are probably going to more than double the pain work um and that's not an exaggeration Payne wrote from an early age all the way until he died, 50 years, averaging over a work a month. So you're talking five or 600 pieces. Wow. And right now there's less than 200 wow. pieces. So um, once we get into this full time, start, we're gonna start late th this late summer. Um, there's six of us diving into this and we're, we're going to uncover an enormous amount of works that never were attributed to him because more than 90 percent of everything that Payne wrote was anonymous and okay. unless you have intimate okay. knowledge of where he was who he was working with who what publishers was he friendly with that you can go through all the works and find him uh, and we also have computer analysis to help us now um the collected works will be an immense project. Mm. So there is no good collection, but you can't go wrong with reading Rights of Man. It's still the the Bible of the democratic revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great place to start. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and we're definitely looking forward to the collected works project and all of the works that are turned up in that, in that research. Um, I'm going to acknowledge Wallace being Garthright. Um, who has their hand up in the chat. So I'm gonna allow that right now. Um, Wallace, if you would like to speak, go ahead and unmute. Yes, this has been a wonderful show and it's inspired me to think of other ways to raise the profile again of pain in all kinds of uh, situations. One thing is if we could push for uh, there may have been many stamps with his name on it, 
but there may be none. Uh, I love the idea of the streets being named for Paine. Um, I think every city ought to have one named uh, Thomas Paine Street. And with the beauty of this, and, and so we've got the stamps, we could ask for a coin. Um, frankly, the $1 bill is going to die, and there's going to be a lot more coins, just like Europe has, and we should be poised to ask for coins. The beauty of this is whether you get it or not, you get people talking about Thomas Paine. And when you get all that talk about Thomas Paine, more and more free-thinking young people will start looking for his writings and discovering him. So I think this could be just another fun thing to do, <laughs> and it might have a great deal uh, of effect of spreading the knowledge of the man's work. There, there was a stamp, uh, a Thomas Paine stamp, that was created and approved. Um, Lewis was the one that instigated this uh, particular project. It was a 40 cent stamp, I believe, uh, blue in color. Uh, I have one, but I don't wanna get up and try to find it. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> on the day that it was um, presented to the public, the presentation started with a prayer and Lewis was so upset about this. He stormed out of the um, formal uh, activities and a, a group of um, <clears throat> reporters uh, followed him outside and, and discussed why he was so upset. And he said, well, Thomas Paine would never have liked a prayer. Yeah. Let's start with his, uh, his stamp <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> Um, can I say something too? Sure. Um, I, I would love to do a, a coin medal of Thomas Paine for so. But secondly, I'm surprised that there isn't a, a great feature movie, a biopic of Thomas Paine, his life. I mean, beginning with a person who's digging up his bones and staying one step ahead of the magistrates, and and then going back to his life. Where you know, as you've heard people talk about uh, him being sick on the boat and almost dying, and his association with Ben Franklin and all the other intellectuals mm. in, in Europe. And so what a wonderful, exciting life. And if there was a film, a uh, biography, something, even uh, something that uh, on PBS, great, there, you know, there, uh, PBS has the uh, great American stories of, of uh, that would be a wonderful thing to, besides a sculpture, because sculpture is permanent and films kind of get turned off and so on, but it would do a lot. You know, somebody that important, to not have yeah. a movie is amazing. Give him the, the, give him the Hamilton the right treatment. The Hamilton treatment, hey? Yeah, Actually, yeah there we go. Make it a musical. Or he liked mm -hmm. to sing anyway. Mm -hmm. John yeah, he did. To be, to, yeah, to, yeah. He did. It would, it, would, it would be excellent segues, just him sitting around drinking brandy, yeah. singing songs. Richard Merle wrote and started to produce a movie in England about Thomas Paine. Um, ah. There, and he didn't get the funding, but Gary knows more about there is, it. There, there is a production under under uh, uh, preparation. Um, um, I don't have a title, but what I've seen and heard, uh, I consulted with the script. It's awesome. It uh, it's ordinary people. It's not famous people in the play. Uh, Thomas Paine mm -hmm. is the core of the. Uh, because he represented the ordinary people. And uh, they're touring now. They're going to be in New Rochelle for Juneteenth celebrations uh, the 19th to do a couple of songs. Um, I really think this might be the thing we're talking about, uh, a Hamilton equivalent for pain. Um, so because the Hamilton, I hate to, and anybody who loves the Hamilton play, is so inaccurate. I couldn't even get it, through the yes. first part. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's grossly inaccurate and it does more yeah. harm than good, but got a, a lot of people interested in reading history, which is good. But yeah. it's taken from a book by Chernow, who mm -hmm. is uh, hates pain and is very conservative. And that's what he modeled his play on, which is a big mistake. But anyway. Well, mm -hmm. um, there was another uh, movie that was being discussed. Uh, with the starring of um, 
oh gosh, Johnny Depp as Thomas Paine. And his wife, Amber Heard, was going to play Madame Bonneville. And when their divorce occurred, the whole production shut down. And mm. it's not yeah. been reestablished since. Uh, but it's, I, I, I saw the, uh, the play um, book and, and all of the script, and it's fabulous. It's but fabulous. unfortunately, um, Johnny Depp just ruined it for everybody. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll happen sooner or later. You know, there, we can only have so many Marvel movies. Yeah. So we're going to make, well, they're going to, they're going to figure it out. Um, uh, I'm going to go. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, it's fun trying to think of who would make a great actor for Thomas Paine. Wouldn't it? My concern would be, I've seen so many wonderful lives, his life without adding anything to it or making it Disney like or whatever. You know, if you just kept it true, um, it would. It's a wonderful story. It's a great story. It doesn't need any kind of embellishment or, it's true. Uh, yeah, and um, and that would add to its credibility. I, I, anyway, it is interesting to try to think of different actors now that uh, might. Uh, yeah, we might have to. Have, we might have to have another event that's just casting the Thomas Paine movie. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we saw a preview of what music could be included with the James Clue concert. That's right. Just continue creating more songs from Thomas Paine's poetry. Maybe we'd have a whole play done. That's right. Oh, per perhaps we can we can get this done in house. Let's go. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge Barbara Dean, who is waiting with her hand up so patiently. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk and just go ahead and um, unmute whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you. I uh, hope you can hear me. I did. You great, thank you. Great. Um, so I wrote in the chat, but it only went to the panelists. Mm. Uh, our, our history of being painites. Uh, one one of which is that we created a CD called Tom Paine's Blues, <laughs> because we think he'd be very blue about the state of this country that he helped to mm -hmm. create. And the other is that we uh, were uh, at the commemorations of his death in in. Uh, 2009 both in England and here and here in it was a whole weekend long thing in Greenwich Village and Bill Moyer's team came to film some of it uh, which was very exciting for us and Graham and I got to be shown singing uh, a couple of songs my husband Graham has written uh, a song a couple of songs one of which he, he wrote about pain and one of which where he set uh, pains some of Payne's words to music so yes I think music is very important but also we were at the uh, beginning of the Thomas Paine Institute at Iona uh, with, where we met Gary Burton. And uh, Gary, maybe you remember Ian Ruskin who did his one man play there. Uh, that's yeah. also not, yeah, that's been, I forget the name of it. Uh, I hope it has Thomas Paine in the title. It's a video and it has been shown on PBS and people could find it if I can only remember mm -hmm. the name of it. But that's a very good place to start. It was very, very well done. Um, as, as a one-man play and it's true what what Zeno says to begin today. the world over to begin the world over thank you I believe, yeah if you just look up uh uh Ruskin uh Thomas Paine it'll come up on Google it, I think it isn't it Ruskin R-A-S no it's you yeah. it's Ian, Ru Ian Ruskin uh, yeah. R-U-S-K Ruskin Ian Ruskin okay <clears throat> Yes, and we're, we're pleased that we were two people. Yeah, it's excellent. We met him early on and we actually suggested to him that he, because he did a wonderful play about um, Harold, Harry, Bridges. Harry Bridges, which which we saw, who was a labor leader. And at that point, we <laughs> we talked to him about doing a play about pain, which, which he did, and he did a beautiful job, better than some of the plays we saw in England. My question is, yeah. Yeah. why do people think that pain is not recognized in this country as a founding father. It makes me furious when I see all the stuff about the founding fathers and the writing of the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence, et cetera, et cetera. And pain is barely mentioned at all. Why do we think this is and what could we do about it? Thanks, uh, Barbara. Isn't it the same uh, uh, sentiment that Teddy Roosevelt had that pain was a dirty atheist, even though he wasn't quite an atheist, that this anti, his, his, um, attack on organized religion um, uh, 
uh, has made him um, um, obscure, you know, just it's hidden from history. He's been uh, he's, he's been taken out of history. So right. I, I think mostly be, because historians are basically lazy mm. and historians are uh, extremely prejudiced. Mm. What they do is they look for facts that support their ideology and that's what they write about. That's what people like Chernow and uh, uh, can't even think of some of their names, but uh, conservative writers of American history dominate the market mm -hmm. and accurate uh, works. There is a great work if you want to really know pain and his impact is uh, Lunacy, L-O-U-N-I-S-S-I, -S -S Thomas Paine and the French Revolution. Uh, if you can read a book like that, it's from an objective scientific history perspective, which Europe embraces and America doesn't. Mm -hmm. America history is often propaganda and is not accurate. So that's a main reason. Um, uh, pain being uh, censored in the 40s and 50s um, because of uh, McCarthyism and other things because he was embraced by the left wing. And uh, that has a, an effect when my generation, people in their 70s now, uh, got to the position of deans of history departments, it started to change. It started to change in the 90s when that old prejudice, that old Teddy Roosevelt mentality uh, was, was overturned. We start to, started to see some more accurate work on Thomas Paine. And that's coming to fruition right now uh, with some European scholars that we're working with on the Collective Works Project. You're gonna see a whole new, new perspective on Paine, um, a complete one, which we only know half his story right now. So um, Excellent. it can be overturned, but that's where it comes from. Thank you. And thank you, Barbara, even, even uh, when, I, when I do the, um, assemblies for children. I'm very careful because I know that they're going to go back to their parents and tell them what, what I said. So I emphasize free thought and free thinking. I do say that Payne was a deist and that he questioned everything. And I even say to the children, it's okay to question everything and everybody even your teachers and your parents. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm taking a risk there, but I think it's an important lesson uh, to, to make sure that Payne's legacy of enlightenment and reason and questioning uh, be extended to the children that are up to. Uh, Edith Ruskin is just a fabulous actor. I actually paid for him to attend our table at the Reason Rally in 2016. Oh. And he did a fabulous job dressed as Thomas Paine, mm -hmm. took pictures with people and, uh, and he, he um, manned the Free Thought Society table for us. Uh, I was so proud that he was there because he was, he was um, exemplifying one of our projects that is so important to us and that is to have the legacy of Thomas Paine be renewed and honored again. Thank you. And, and thank you, thank you, Could Barbara, I, for this. I have one more thing, do you sure. mind? Yeah. Just that, and, and it's funny that she thought that Ian's name was Raskin because it's Jamie Raskin who I really give many kudos to because during the impeachment hearings, uh, he mentioned Paine at least four times at which we stood up and cheered each time. And I have a wonderful poster that was put around uh, the DC area for Raskin's, I guess it's for his reelection, which has a picture of Thomas Paine and a picture of Jamie Raskin. And I just wish there were more politicians like him. I mean, I wonder, Gary, if you could, when you, when you complete this project, if we can get the word out to politicians because they need to read Thomas Paine. So thank you. Uh, thank you. He, he, he named his son after Thomas Paine, right? Uh, Jamie Raskin. So yeah. it, was, it was very important to him. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge Seth Knight from our, um, who has his hand up right now. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk and go ahead and unmute whenever you're ready. 
All right, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to say this is wonderful, just wonderful. Thomas Paine is such um, an important character uh, because he really was a character uh, in American history. And I, I would just like to say uh, one of my, I had a question answered in the chat and I just wanted to put my two cents on Thomas Paine and um, how he may have changed his beliefs if he were alive today. Mm -hmm. I do have a very firm belief that Payne probably might have stepped away from democracy and republics and the government itself if he were alive today, just because <laughs> of uh, some of the things he expressed, like how re republics um, put a light on the darkness of people's minds and how it uncovered things like that and you know he's he was rational enough to be able to realize when things that he held were wrong since you know of course it is religious upbringing and his time preaching as a quaker so he would have been able to recognize that that was not correct and i just i i really do believe that um he might have been able to embrace that a little more in the modern day. Of course, though, his job in you know the 18th century was to dispel monarchism and usher in these new revolutionary ideas, which he did not really get to see the full impact of, given that he died so short after uh, there, you know, a light establishment of what he wanted in America. So I just wanted to see what everyone else would have thought about that or what he would be today, especially since he's inspired so many revolutionary people like uh, in more socialist or anarchist movements. Well, I caught, I caught something you said, Seth, about Quakerism. Thomas Paine never advocated Quakerism. He never preached Quaker um, philosophy. Mm. So that was just who his family was. Mm. Uh, the, the father uh, was a Quaker and the mother was an Anglican. All right. Um, you knew that. But um, please go ahead, panelists. Um, I'm interested in Mendy's uh, and Gary's uh, view of that. Yeah, so if I may add, there's been a lot of discussion about Thomas Paine's writing, you know, his intellectual. Uh, and, and that's, as a community, I've always pushed back against us only focusing on the intellectual aspect because it does tend to highlight white male voices um, uh, over those who are on the ground. And I really think that if Thomas Paine were alive today, since he was one of the first advocates for reparations, he might have been in line with the Black Panthers. He might have been in line with um, like Cesar Chavez and other people's grassroots movements. And I think that that's something that is very, very important. There's been a number of people who have asked about what did he say about women? And it's been stated uh, a number of times that he was an advocate for women's rights mm -hmm. on this on this program. And I think it's important to understand that even as I, like, as I said in the beginning, that he probably would be on the front lines protesting against the death of George Floyd, against Breonna Taylor, against other people who were victims of police brutality, other people who have lost their lives senselessly as a result of institutional um, violence and injustice. So I really think that he would have been more grassroots in that and definitely more revolutionary you know, there is now a bill um, in, in being introduced about reparations. Certainly, um, we can take notes from Thomas Paine and his anti-slavery uh, activism and his anti-slavery stance on that. So I really think that, again, like Margaret said, he was ahead of his time. He would be right in line with what we are seeing, you know, on the front lines today. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there would have been much of a difference um, outside of, you know, perhaps he would be more on the ground as opposed to simply writing about it because he was already on the ground mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, at that time. Right. 
And then he's. Uh, I, I can add something to that. Yes, please, Gary. I'm sorry. Uh, um, in, in 1778, 79, Paine actually led mass democracies outside of the government structure to organize the people to stop the hoarding by the merchant class uh, and causing shortages. He also helped organize uh, the militia rank and file uh, members who were volunteering for the army. Um, so he was on the ground actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, he. He always operated that way. He always was a practical activist, which gets little attention from the biographies. But he did that all the way through in the French Revolution. He wrote the pamphlets that uh, the big massacre in 1790, I'm getting my dates wrong here, two, 1791, when there was a mass demonstration um, and Lafayette led the troops down and, and slaughtered. It was Payne's manifesto that organized that rally. And he, he was on the ground there um, organizing that. So yes, Payne was a activist as much as a writer his whole life. And let's not forget why he was imprisoned in France. He advocated for a peaceful resolution to the French Revolution by not killing people the reign of terror was, was something he wrote against, and that's what caused him to go to prison. He was such a humanist that he wanted to spare the life of, of the king. And, and this was anarchy in regards to the French. You know, they wanted to kill everybody, including Thomas Paine. <laughs> <clears throat> so what a brave person he was uh, to stand up for humanism and, and life and, and, and all the things that we value now as enlightened people. Thank you. And thank you, Seth, for the excellent question. Oh, thank uh, you guys for answering. Uh, and thank you, all the panelists for answering. Thank you, Margaret, for uh, correcting me and have a nice day. Thank you thank so much. Um, Melissa, do we have any more hands raised or? Um... We do not have any hands raised at this moment. We do have still a bunch of questions in our Q&A um, and I'm going through them and finding, um, finding questions. I do have a question right now from Lynn Litchfield and that is, what would Mr. Payne think of our current two corporate party system? That's a hard one. I <laughs> I'm agree. not going that one. <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas about what Thomas Paine might think of this whole, um, like the influence of lobbyists and the interest, uh, the, the influence of interest groups when it comes to our democracy? Um, hmm. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a thinker. Um, well, one of the things we know is that he did not uh, want to see people killed and, um, you know, he, as a Quaker, he was a very peace loving man, um, but he also picked up arms to fight in the revolution. So, you know, he had a very reasonable um, uh, view of, of being involved in a conflict. Uh, but, you know, what would he say about the second amendment? What would he say about so many things? Uh, we, we can only speculate on those items, and it's not our job to do that. All we can do is read his work and understand he was a man of his time, and yet he was so ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And we can draw our own conclusions when we put together the facts, such as uh, him being, uh, he valued life so much that if an AK-47 had been invented during his time, he would have been against anyone owning that. <laughs> Why would he want life ruined in a second? You know? So, you know, we can speculate all kinds of things, but, but that's really not uh, something we should or could do. Right. I mean, like, I think in the case of any of the American founders, this is such this is such a this is a reality so far removed from anything that they could have conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not yeah. you're not comparing apples to apples here. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, 
for those of us that want to reflect and think about what what um, any enlightenment or or revolutionary thinker might think about what our modern life has become, I think that it is so far removed from from anything that any of those folks sweating in Philadelphia came up with um, in in um, that summer uh, during the revolution. So I mean, we can we can absolutely we can absolutely um, speculate that that it it would be alarming because you're going straight from zero to, you know, a thousand when it comes to um, the, the way that things are decided and the ways, the way that um, our democracy has come to function. So, you know, I, I'm sure that they would be alarmed. It's, it's alarming. Even to those of us who are, who have been alive for the last couple decades, it's alarming. <laughs> Um, now, I, I, I definitely want to move on to some of the rest of our lovely questions here. It looks like we have about 51 questions. Some of them are a little bit duplicate -y, so I'm going to double up if and, I can. Um, Melissa, Melissa let's, let's, let's make sure people have put their email address so that when we end this session at 930, we can also um, follow up with a copy of the chat and we'll take the questions that have not been answered. And if you have an email, we'll get you an answer to your question. Actually, if you've asked, if you've asked your question via the question and answer function, your email's are automatically recorded because of um, the way that it's tied in with your name. So you're good in that case. But if you have a question that you've asked within the chat, just go ahead and either pop a Q&A question, um, put your question in the Q&A, um, function down there at the bottom or um, just add your email and we'll get back to you that way. Um, so uh, we will. Let's take one more question. Melissa. One more question. One more question. Let's see here. Um, that one's a little similar. <laughs> okay. What do we think that uh, that Thomas Paine, okay, Thomas Paine was not afraid to challenge the status quo, even among the liberals of his own day. What challenges do you think Paine would have for us as humanists and skeptics today? This is from Ray Sylvester. I think it's an excellent question to end with. I think it's the, I think it's the exact same issues that he had raised when he was alive. Um, the concept of democracy uh, has, has not been actualized. Um, he, he opposed government of elites, governments of oligarchy, and it's still a boot on the back of our neck. Um, and that would be his main, I mean, that's what he fought for. That's why he fought with the Federalists so much because the Federalist Party was based on, the Federalist Party, which they write all the history books about and they ignore the radical element from Philadelphia, uh, the, the Federalist Party was known as the English Party in the 1790s because all the Federalist Party wanted to do was cut contracts with England again. And they actually in the Jay Treaty, they gave up American sovereignty to England again, which led to the War of 1812 eventually. Um, so that's why Payne fought to a <clears throat> dying breath against the Federalist Party. It just wasn't uh, democratic at all. It had no ambitions to be democratic. So I think he would raise the same issues uh, today as he raised back then. You should, people should read, if you want a place to start, the letters to the citizens of the United States, uh, which he wrote between 1803 and 1805, I believe, um, eight letters. I quoted from one of them about the truth thing. Um, uh, you'll get more of a sense of modern politics, uh, an oligarchs against the people uh, mentality. That was pain. Um, and so he'd be, he'd be writing and saying much of the same things with different names, but the same things. And I think Thomas Paine would have been uh, extremely upset about how religion has become so dominant in our government 
uh, as well as in society, um, creating so much superstition and so much delusional thinking. Um, he was such a man of reason that religion has become out of control. Uh, and it, I think it leads to the acceptance of lies and conspiracy theories. So in my wildest dreams, I would love Thomas Paine to come back and write uh, part four of the age of reason <laughs> and um, comment on um, how harmful religious delusion and superstition has become. Thank you. All right, everybody. So we do have a number of questions still unanswered. If, if we haven't gotten to you yet, we'll, we'll be following up with you um, individually via email. Um, I would really like to take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists and all of you who have chosen to spend your Tuesday evening with us here um, exploring the life and the legacy of Thomas Paine. Um, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Margaret, who will close us out. Well, we have a few people to thank. And first, uh, thank you, Melissa, for a wonderful job co-hosting this event with me yeah. and providing us with an excellent Zoom. Uh, your expertise yeah. is commendable. Um, a big thank you to James Clue for his unique and entertaining pre-event Thomas Paine themed music and short stories. Uh, we are also very grateful to Congressman Jamie Raskin for sending his opening statement and warm greetings for this event. And of course, for his support of the Thomas Paine Statue Project. And also we thank the speakers who conveyed the life story of Thomas Paine, Mandisa Thomas, Tom Flynn, Andrew Seidel, and Gary Burton. And this event would not have been possible without the sponsorship of the Free Thought Society, the Center for Inquiry, the American Humanist Association, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and the Thomas Paine National Historical Association. I also thank Dan Barker for singing the song, The World Is My Country, during our musical interlude and five minute break. It was a great pleasure to hear from Zenos Frudakis as he shared information about the Thomas Paine Statue Project with us. Thank you, Zenos. If you are moved to make a donation to the project, Please see the Thomas Paine Memorial Association's website at thomaspainmemorial.org slash donation. And thank you all for attending the Thomas Paine Day. I'll end this event with just one more Thomas Paine quote that seems appropriate in consideration of the current social and political problems we are currently experiencing. Thomas Paine said, Reason obeys itself. Ignorance submits to whatever is dictated to it." End quote. So may reason prevail over ignorance and may we never live under a dic dictatorship. Good night all. Please run the credits, Melissa, as we got know it. James Clue's song, Liberty Tree, one more time. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. In a chariot of light from the regions of day, the goddess of liberty came. Ten thousand celestials directed the way, and hither conducted the day. Oh, a fair budding branch from the gardens above Where millions with millions agree She brought in her hand as a pledge of her love The plant she named Liberty Tree The celestial exotic struck deep in the ground Like a native it flourished and bore The fame of its fruit drew the nations around To seek out the peaceable shore 
Unmindful of names or distinctions, they came, for freemen like brothers agreed. With one spirit and do, they one friendship pursued, and the temple was Liberty Tree. Why beneath this fair tree, like the patriarchs of old, the bread and contentment they ate? Unvexed with the troubles of silver and gold, the cares of the grand and the great. Nor with timber and tar they old England supplied, and supported her power on the sea. Her battles they fought without getting a groat for the honor of Liberty Tree. Tis a tale most profane how all the tyrannical powers, kings, commons, and lords, are uniting amain to cut down this guardian of ours. From the east to the west, blow the trumpet to arms of the land, let the sound of it flee. Let the far and the near all unite with a cheer in defense of our liberty tree. In defense of our liberty tree. Tree!